Good afternoon, my dear students, and today we are having the second lecture of the course Gastroenterology, and the topic name is Dyspepsia and Chronic Gastritis. So let's start from the first part of this topic. Dyspepsia symptoms include the constellation of upper gastrointestinal complaints such as pelchin, postprandial pulmus, early satiety, epigastric pain, and epigastric pain. Functional dyspepsia can be diagnosed only when an organic pathology for the symptoms is not identified. Also, there are several organic cases for the dyspepsia. The main causes are peptic ulcer disorder, GRT, some medication, and gastric malignancy. Also, gastric cancer as a cause of dyspepsia is a concern for both healthcare providers and patients. It's and it's not uncommon in North America, but very common in non-developed or developing countries. Upper abdominal pain or discomfort is the most prominent symptom in the patient with the peptic ulcer as a cause of dyspepsia. Discomfort from ulcers is usually centered in the gastrum and it may occasionally localize to the right or left upper while classic symptoms of duodenal ulcer occur uh, when acid is secreted in the absence of the food buffer, peptic ulcer can be associated with food provoked symptoms and thus the utility of the using symptoms related to food and digestion to predict the presence of an ulcer in unreliable. Peptic ulcer can be also associated with proprandial belching, epigastric pounds, erysitation, fatty food intolerance, nausea, or occasional vomiting. Gastroesophageal malignancy is an uncommon cause of chronic dyspepsia, at least in the Western part of this world. But incidence is high in patient Asia, Hispanic patient, or Afro-Caribbean extraction. The incidence of the gastroesophageal malignancy increases with ages. When present, abdominal pain tends to be epigastric, black, and mild early in the disease, but more severe and constant as the disease progresses. In addition, other symptoms and signs typically evolve with the disease progression, such as anemia, fatigue, or weight loss. Classic biliary pain is characterized by episodic intense dull pain located in the right upper quadrant, the picastrian or less often substernal area that may radiate to the back, particularly to the right shoulder blade. The pain is often associated with diuresis, nausea, or vomiting. The pain is constant and not colicky. It's not exacerbated by movement and not relieved by squeezing, belching, vocal movements, or passage of flatus. The pain typically lasts at least 3 30 minutes, plating within an hour. The pain then starts to subside. With an entire attack, you will last in less than 6 hours. Drug-induced dyspepsia. Some medications as non steroidal no anti-inflammatory drugs or type, particularly COX-2 selective inhibitors can cause dyspepsia even in the absence of the peptic ulcer disease. Other drugs that have been implicated in drug-induced dyspepsia include calcium channel blockers, potassium supplements, vitamin D overdoses, iron, uh, supplements, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and others including certain antibiotics, for example, erythromycin. Other cases of dyspepsia can be cellular disease or chronic pancreatitis rarely but present, uh, can present with dyspepsia. Uh, other uh, rare cases of dyspepsia include infiltrative disease of the stomach, for example, with zonophilic gastroenteritis, diabetic radiculopathy, met metabolic disturbances as hypercalcemia, hepatoma, steatohepatitis, and others. Functional or idiopathic or non ulcer dyspepsia requires exclusion of other organical causes of dyspepsia. It's defined by the presence of one or more of the following postprandial fullness, early cetacean, epigastric pain or burning, and no evidence of structural disease to explain the symptoms. 
the pathophysiology diagnosis and management of functional dyspepsia will be discussed later separately from the origin. Functional dyspepsia is defined by the wrong four criteria and classified into proprandial distress syndrome and epigastric pain syndrome. Functional dyspepsia diagnosis can be uh, made in case if presence of more than one symptom of proprandial fullness, early satiety, epigastric pain or epigastric burning, and no evidence of structural disease. In one third uh, part of the cases, uh, functional dyspepsia can be represented only by postprandial syndrome or early satiety uh, syndrome uh, uh, more than three days a week for the three past months and onset that more than six months before diagnosis. Usual symptoms are early satiety, bloating, nausea, vomiting, retching, or decreased appetite. In other one sort of uh, part of the cases of functional dyspepsia can be represented only by epigastric pain syndrome which includes epigastric pain or uh, and burning more than one day a week for the past three months and with outset more than six months before diagnosis. Usual symptoms according to the name of this syndrome, epigastric pain or epigastric burning or both together. And the left to uh, around one seventh of all cases of functional dyspepsia will be represented by combination of postprandial distress syndrome and epigastric pain syndrome. Etiology of functional dyspepsia include gastric neuromuscular dysfunction, uh, psych psychological distress, duodenal acid exposure, dysmotility, and inflammation. Gastric neuromuscular dysfunction, including delayed aptic emptying, impaired gastrocombus relaxation with blunting of postprandial accumulation, and altered gastric mechanosensitivity has been of particular interest in this area. Psychological distress uh, usually associated with dyspepsia, with research, but research showing both that distress and anxiety can precede symptoms, and that symptoms can induce distress and anxiety. Thus, a bi-directional gut-brain pathway mechanism has been proposed. Duodenal exit exposure. Exposure. This is a preliminary evidence concerning the presence of increased postprandial duodenal acid exposure and functional dyspepsia patients with prominent nausea symptoms. In addition, duodenal motility and bolus clearance impairment have been induced by instilling acid into the duodenum, raising concern that duodenal acid triumph. It's a triumph pathology may contribute to dyspepsia symptoms in a subset of the patient. There is growing evidence regarding the role of the duodenal inflammation and duodenal isophilia in the uh, functional dyspepsia etiology. Alarm uh, futures. Uh, can, uh, each patient with uh, dyspepsia or thought the uh, there, there is a rule for other gastrointestinal pathologies such as GRD, peptic ulcer disorder. Uh, if patient has these symptoms, patients should be uh, more precisely observed and the anus to exclude life-changing or life-threatening disorder as cancer, uh, for example, or other severe disorders. These alarm futures are Unintentional weight loss for past three months, new or progressive dysphagia, odinophagia, persistent vomiting, unexplained iron deficiency anemia, palpable mass or lymphadenopathy, uh, particularly in abdomen, but lymphadenopathy or these masses can be present in other locations and due to metastasis of these tumors. Uh, can lead to gastrointestinal disorders and the appearance of the symptoms of gastrointestinal disorders pathology. Family history of upper gastrointestinal malignancy. Yes, we talk about uh, our today's topic and childhood span in the country with the high risk for gastrointestinal malignancy. 
diagnostic evaluation of functional dyspepsia. By definition, functional dyspepsia is diagnosed in the absence of an organic pathology for the dyspepsia symptoms. As outlined previously, patients with functional dyspepsia report a range of symptoms that can vary greatly in severity, and symptoms are not a reliable way to differentiate organic from functional dyspepsia. Uh, goal of evaluation is to rule out organic etiology for the patient's symptoms. Evaluation is based on the patient's age, presence of alarm futures when aimed previously, severity of the symptoms, risk of malignancy, and physical examination findings. As a focal gastroenterologist, is recommended in patients aged 60 years or above, or in any other patient in, with the present one alarm future. Uh, a rapidly progressive alarm future, clinical significant weight loss, or overt gastrointestinal bleeding. Endoscopy with the gut biopsy is recommended for any patient aged 60 or older with dyspepsia due to the increased risk of the cancer of the, this age group. In order to ensure detection of Helicobacter pylori infection, gastric biopsy should be obtained from the lesser curvature of the antrum. Greater curvature of the antrum, lesser curvature of the body, greater curvature of the body, and insura angularis. Tudinal biopsy should be obtained in immunosuppressed patients, particularly bone marrow transplant patients, to exclude graft VC host disease. Patient under age 60 without alarm future should undergo Helicobacter pylori testing via stool antigen testing or urea breast test for detection of Helicobacter pylori, followed by treatment and eradication confirmation if testing is positive for active infection as a cause of dyspepsia. It's important to ensure that patients undergoing testing do not take proton pump inhibitor for four weeks prior to testing to receive adequate result as PPI can use can cause a false negative test result. Gastric emptying testing should be considered in patients with prominent nausea or vomiting, particularly in gastroparesis risk factor as present. For example, diabetes, evidence of connective tissue disorder, or more diffuse gastrointestinal dysmotility disorder. Celiac disease should be ruled out in patients with dyspepsia via either duodenal biopsy or anti tissue transglutaminase and immunoglobulin A antibody serology testing. Medications should also be reviewed as dyspepsia symptoms can be induced by several drugs we already knew previously, including uh, widely spreaded non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs. The patient diet should be also reviewed for potential triggers, including alcohol or coffee use, which can increase gastric acidity and uh, lead to changes of the gastric and esophageal motility. Treatment of functional dyspepsia and dyspepsia of thought. Also, Helicobacter pylori associated dyspepsia is not technically considered under the umbrella of functional dyspepsia, uh, but practically there is no genic pathology, it's rather infectious pathology. Helicobacter pylori infection should be treated and confirmation of eradication should be performed if clinically indicated. Uh, usually, Helicobacter pylori infection causes approximately 5% of dyspepsia cases. Prokinetics and fundus relaxing therapy uh, uh, should be prescribed in case if uh, potential benefits uh, are prevalent uh, over the potential side effects because there is no effectiveness to treat functional dyspepsia is clearly observed. Uh, right now, there are several, several doubts uh, should be uh, prescribed this class of drugs or not. But some, if patient has problem with the motility, you can prescribe domperidone or itopridine therapies. 
acid reducing therapy uh, should be prescribed PPI as first line therapy for the functional dyspepsia. Uh, despite studies shown PPI therapy to be effective only in 14% of patients, decreasing of the gastric acidity will lead to improvement of the symptoms. If PPI therapy is ineffective or provides inadequate relief, guidelines of the American College of Gastroenterol sorry, Gastroenterology recommended trial of neuromodulator medication to improve motility uh, and to decrease some of symptoms as early satiety, bloating. 86% uh, of the patient with functional dyspepsia uh, with a negative glucose hydrogen breast test were randomizing the treatment of the two-week course of uh, rifaximin uh, and they, they found that uh, uh, this drug can lead to relief uh, of uh, global dyspeptic symptoms in 78% of patients compared with uh, 52 patients um, in the placebo group. So if previous four steps were not uh, helpful to treat functional dyspepsia and you absolutely sure that you, uh, patient, your patient have functional but not urgent dyspepsia, please use this drug to help patient relieve the symptoms. Uh, also, psychological therapies and treatment of the functional dyspepsia uh, showed a uh, great improvement in uh, dyspepsia-related symptoms comparing with uh, a combination therapy group and you should always think about this type of therapy to help patient uh, uh, to reach improvement uh, if drug, especially if drug therapy uh, were not effective or maybe in some type of patients with uh, neurological problems, neurosis, or chronic uh, pain patient, uh, rather psychological therapy in absence of hepatocellular infection uh, will be more effective than acid reducing or neuromodulator therapy. Uh, next slide will show you actually treatment algorithm of the functional dyspepsia. So if uh, actually you treat your patient with, uh, you tested your patient and you know that patient has no helicobacter pylori is possible, a cause of dyspepsia, so please consider four-week trial of moderate dosage of proton pump inhibitors. In case of poor response, consider herbal or neuromodulator therapy. In case if this therapy is still not working and didn't, doesn't bring relief, a prokinetic or fundus relaxation agent should be helpful. In uh, if patient uh, test, uh, was tested on Helicobacter pylori and the result is positive, please prescribe treatment or indication of Helicobacter pylori infection as a cause of functional dyspepsia. The same uh, similar argument to, to, uh, uh, that can help you actually um, to treat your patient um, as good as it possibly can. So dyspepsia, uh, before treat dyspepsia with actually medication and refer patient to any uh, uh, physician or specialist, site specialist. Uh, uh, if patient has no actually around symptoms, you should, don't forget at first. To review his medication, maybe they are a cause of dyspepsia. Uh, the next step should be lifestyle modification, including healthy eating, weight reduction, some smoking cessation, diet if needed, uh, plus promoting the use of antacids, alginates, continued therapy. If there is a response, let patient to uh, continue your advices and check him in several times, uh, two or four weeks. If there is no response, please start treatment with PPI 
uh, in full dosages for around the months. If response is good, please change your PPI therapy to lifestyle modification uh, alone with the uh, reviewing of medication. If maybe due to some reason patient uh, took another new medication for this period you haven't uh, found from during the previous check of the patient. The next step, uh, if uh, your PPI is not working, patient has uh, still symptoms and there is no prominent symptoms, it's to add H2 blocker around for the months and to check will be or not any improvement. If improvement is okay, please uh, return patient to lifestyle modification uh, and uh, prevent patient to not take medication which can have possible side effects leading to dyspepsia syndrome the appearance. Chronic gastritis is our next topic. Uh, in case I forgot to tell that in case of organic dyspepsia, treatment of dyspepsia will be, it's a treatment of underlying disease which can cause uh, a sign and symptoms of dyspepsia. So no specific treatment for dyspepsia needed, but in case of uh, the symptomatical treatment can be used PPI therapy uh, in combination with H2 blockers therapy if it's needed till underlying disease will be treated. Second topic of our lecture today, it's the chronic gastritis topic. The term gastritis was first time used in 1728 by German physician George Ernstahl to describe the inflammation of the inner lining of the stomach, now known to be secondary to mucosal injury. In the past, many considered gastritis are useful histological findings, but not the disease. This all changed with the discovery of Helicobacter pylori by Robert Warren and Barry Marshall in 1982, leading to the identification, description, and classification of multitude of different gastritis types. Usually we use the Sydney system for classification of gastritis. It incorporates etiology, topography, and the morphological features to be documented when reading and reporting endoscopic gastric biopsies. The topography of gastritis is the core of the classification. Etiological hints can be added as a prefix and the graded variables as suffix. Typical examples would be, for example, Helicobacter pylori, pan gastritis, meaning gastritis of all stomach, you can see it clear in the picture, severally active with mild pan panotrophy, atrophy part seen in the gray variables. Specific, non specific, in our case it's specific because it's Helicobacter pylori, specific spe gastritis, so, so etiology is no. Here you can see the same update, but updated this uh, Sydney classification with the time it was updated. And if you will look precisely on this scheme, you will see that non allotropic type gastritis uh, with etiology of Helicobacter pylori or any other uh, factors include uh, known for all students type B gastritis. Uh, Otherwise, type A gastritis is a type of atrophic autoimmune gastritis. And type C gastritis can be uh, referred to special form of gastritis, chemical or usually it's a chemical gastritis caused by different agents, including NSAIDs, bile or chemical irritation. By the scheme diagnosis can be made as chronic uh, for uh, atrophic autoimmune gastritis, for example, type A or uh, special form of uh, it will be chronic chemical and state induced reflux gastritis or type C gastritis or a chronic isenophilic uh, allergic uh, isolated granulomatose, for example, gastritis or allergic gastritis. 
or chronic or acute infectious gastritis caused by, um, let it be, fungal gastritis. In clinical practice, gastritis staging is uh, nowadays is done using that operative link on gastritis or Olga assessment staging system for reporting gastric histology. Gastritis staging combines the atrophy score, which is determined by biopsy, and the atrophy topography, which is determined by directed biopsy method. Helicobacter pylori is the leading cause of chronic gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, gastric adenocarcinoma, and primary gastritic lymphoma. First described by Marshall and Warren in 1983, Helicobacter pylori is a spiral gram-negative rod that has the ability to colonize and infect the stomach. The lipopolysaccharides of uh, the outer membrane of Helicobacter pylori, here it is, uh, are the major component of its ability for colonization and persistence. The bacteria survive within the mucous layer that covers the gastric surface epithelium and the upper portions of the gastric alveoli. The infection is usually acquired during childhood. The virulent factors responsible for establishing colonization include urease, flagella, hemotaxis system, and adhesives. With increasing antibiotic resistance, these virulence factors provide alternative drug or vaccine targets for Helicobacter pylori eradication and prevention. The virulence factors responsible for immune escape help Helicobacter pylori escape from the host immune clearance and allow its persistence in the human stomach. The disease induction neuron factors include several genes presented on the picture, uh, which help bacteria to survive despite our uh, body or host resistance. When present in the stomach, the bacteria passes through the mucous layer and becomes established in the luminal surface of the stomach, causing an intense inflammatory response of underlying tissue. tissue. Here on the picture, you can see bacteria and the gastric holes till it will be enhanced in the mucous layer. The presence of Helicobacter pylori is associated with tissue, tissue damage and the histological findings of both an active and chronic gastritis. The host response to Helicobacter pylori I'm sorry, and its bacterial products is composed of T and B lymphocytes, denoting chronic gastritis, followed by infiltration of the lamina propria and gastric epithelium by poly polymorphonuclear lymphocytes that eventually phagocytes the bacteria. The presence of these uh, leukocytes in the gastric mucosa is diagnostic of the active gastritis. An increased duodenal acid loom, load may precipitate and wash out the bile salts, which normally inhibit the growth of Helicobacter pylori. Progressive damage to the duodenum promotes gastric foveolar metaplasia, resulting in sites for Helicobacter pylori growth and more inflammation. This cycle renders the duodenal bulb increasingly un unable to neutralize acid entering from the stomach until changes of the bulb structure and function are sufficient for an ulcer to develop. Helicobacter pylori can survive in areas of the gastric metaplasia of the duodenum, contributing to the development of peptic ulcer. Various strains of Helicobacter pylori exhibit differences in virulence factors and their differences influence the clinical outcome of Helicobacter pylori infection. People infected with Helicobacter pylori strains can, that can secrete the evacuating toxin A are more likely, for example, to develop peptic ulcers than the people infected with the strains that do not secrete these toxins. Interaction of Helicobacter pylori with the surface mucosa results in the release of interleukin-8, which leads to recruitment of polymorphonuclear leukocytes and may begin the entire inflammatory process. Gastric epithelial cells express class II molecular molecules, uh, which uh, may increase the inflammatory response by presenting antigens leading to an activation.
validation of numerous transcript transcription factors. This is uh, turn leads to further cytokine release and more inflammation with high level of cytokines, particularly tumor necrosis factors and multiple interleukins. leukins. Uh, they are pro inflammatory interleukins and detected in the gastric mucosa of the patient with Helicobacter pylori gastritis. This inflammatory response leads to functional changes in the stomach depending on the areas of the stomach involved. When inflammation affects the gastric corpus, parietal cells are inhibited, leading to reduced acid secretion. Continued inflammation results in loss of parietal cells and the reduction of acid secretion becomes permanent. Antral inflammation alters the interplay between gastrin and somatostatin secretion, affecting G cells and D cells, respectively. Specifically, gastrin secretion is abnormal in individuals who are affected with Helicobacter pylori with an exaggerated meal simulated release of gastrin, being the most prominent abnormality. Helicobacter pylori associated chronic gastritis progresses according to the following of two main topographical patterns, which have different clinical consequences. If patients have antral predominant gastritis, this is characterized by inflammation that is mostly limited to the antrum. Individuals with peptic ulcers usually demonstrate this pattern or multifocal atrophic gastritis. This uh, type uh, of gastritis is characterized by the involvement of the corpse and gastric antrum with the progressive development of gastric atrophy, I'm sorry, loss of the gastric glands and parietal replacement of the gastric glands by intestinal type epithelium or intestinal metaplasia. In other words, individuals who develop gastric carcinoma and gastric ulcers usually demonstrate this pattern. Autoimmune atrophic gastritis is associated with the serum antiparietal and anti-intric factor antibodies. The gastric corpus undergoes progressive atrophy. If deficiency occurs and patient may develop pernicious anemia. The development of the chronic gastritis, sometimes called type A gastritis, limited to the corpus fundus mucosa and marked diffuse atrophy of parietal and chief cells characterized in autoimmune atrophic gastritis. In addition to hypochlorhydria, autoimmune gastritis is associated with the serum antiparietal and anti uh, intrastomic factor antibodies that can cause intrastomic factor deficiency, which in turn causes decreased availability of cobalamin, eventually leading to pernicious anemia in some patients. Hypochlorhydria induces gastrin producing cell hyperplasia, leading to hypergastrin anemia. Gastrin exerts atrophic effects of enterochromatin like cells, and it's, uh, it's hypothesized to be one of the mechanisms leading to the development of gastric carcinoid tumors. In autoimmune gastritis, autoantibodies are directed against the three uh, at least antigens, including interesting factor, cytoplasmic, and plasma membrane antigens. There are two types of anti-intrinsic factor, types 1 and type 2. Type 1 antibody prevents the attachment of B12 vitamin to anti-intrinsic anti factor. And type 2 antibody prevents the attachment of the B12 vitamin uh, intrinsic factor complex to the ileal receptors. It means there is no perfusion of the B12 from the gastric uh, lumen to the ileal cells. T cell lymphocytes infiltrate the gastric mucosa and contribute to the epithelial cell destruction and resulting in the gastric atrophy. On the picture you can see flattening on the gastric folds with the sign of inflammation and hem small hemorrhages as a sign of atrophic gastritis. 
Granulomatous gastritis is a rare entity. Causes can be divided into infectional diseases, non-infectional diseases, and idiopathic, which are observed in approximately 25% of cases. Tuberculosis may affect the stomach and cause caseating granulomas. Fungi, including cryptococcus, can also cause caseating granulomas and necrosis. This is a finding that is usually observed in patients who are immunosuppressed. Granulomatous gastritis has also been associated with Helicobacter pylori. A granuloma present on picture is organized aggregation of combined lymphocytic, histiocytic, and plasmatic infiltrates, granulomatous inflammation. When this organized collection of the cells is defined in the stomach, is referred to as granulomatous gastritis. Granulomatous gastritis is a type of chronic gastritis and can be subclassified based on the etiology into infectious, non-infectious, and idiopathic. Non-infectious diseases are the usual cause of gastrogranulomas. This include Crohn disease, sarcoidosis, isolated granulomatous gastritis, and so it can be present in patients with different vasculitis or rheumatic disorder patients. Granulomas have also been described in association with the gastric malignancies, including carcinoma and malignant lymphoma. Sarcoid-like granulomas may be observed in people who use cocaine and foreign material is occasionally absorbed in the granulomas too. So as you can see on the picture in the center presented inflammation and different type of granuloma it will differ surrounded by the inflammatory cell and sometimes surrounded by uh, connective tissue cell. Gastritis in immunocompromised patient. Uh, usually, uh, the cause of such type of gastritis, the most frequent cause of such type of gastritis, is cytomegalovirus infection, uh, and absorbed in usually this infection, uh, infectious gastritis in patients with underlying immunosuppression. But it still remains unclear whether a cytomegalovirus infection gastritis promotes the development of gastric carcinoma. Histologically, patchy myelin from metro infiltrate is absorbed in the lamina propria. Here you can see too. Typical intranuclear resinophilic inclusion and occasionally smaller intracytoplasmatic inclusion is present in gastric epithelial cells. And in the endothelial and mesenchymal cells in the lamina propria, severe necrosis may result in ulceration. Here you can see erosions but there, and here the small ulcer. Other infectious causes in, uh, of the chronic gastritis in immunosuppressed patients include herpes simplex virus, which causes basophilic intranuclear inclusions in epithelial cells, or mycobacterial infection involving mycobacterium avium intracellular, are characterized by diffuse infiltration of the lamina propria by histiocytes which rarely form granulomas too. Other types of gastritis can be a lymphocytic gastritis is the type of the chronic gastritis characterized by the dense infiltration of the surface of the foveolar epithelium by T lymphocytes and associated chronic infiltrates in the lamina propria. Because its histopathology is similar to that of the celiac disease, Lymphocytic gastritis has been proposed to result from intraluminar antigens. High anti Helicobacter pylori antibody titers have been found in patients with lymphocytic gastritis, and in limited studies, the inflammation disappeared after Helicobacter pylori was eradicated. You can see these inflammatory changes represented during endoscopy and the small balls that were put under the mucosal surface. Eosinophilic gastritis is a large number of xenophils may observe with the parasitic infections such as those caused by Eustoma rotundatum or Anazakis marina. Eosinophilic gastritis can be part of the spectrum of eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Also, the gastric antrum is commonly affected and can cause gastric obstruction.
This conduction can affect any segment of GI tract and can be segmented. Patients frequently have peripheral blood eosinophilia. In some cases, especially in children, eosinophilic gastroenteritis can result from food allergy, usually to milk or soy protein. Eosinophilic gastroenteritis can be also found in some patients with connective tissue disorders, including scleroderma, polymyositis, or dermatomyositis. Helicobacter pylori, chronic gastritis, which is usually symptomatic but may manifest as uh, epigastric I'm sorry, pain, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, early satiety, or weight loss. Symptoms may occur with the development of complication of the chronic helicobacter pylori gastritis, which include peptic ulcer, gastric and, and adenocarcinoma, and mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma. The clinical manifestation of autoimmune gastritis is primarily related to the deficiency of common cobalamin, which is not adequately absorbed because of intrinsic factor deficiency resulting from the severe gastric parietal cell atrophy. The disease has an insidious onset and progresses slowly. Cobalamin deficiency affects the hematologic and gastrointestinal and neurological systems. In multisystemic diseases, specific symptoms related to the gastric involvement may be minor. Cisating granulomas, a secondary to tuberculosis, may be found in the absence of lung disease in patients who are malnourished, immunosuppressed, or alcoholic. Patients with a chronic disease and gastric involvement may report abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. Gastric involvement in Crohn's disease is almost invariably associated with the intestinal disease and as intestinal manifestation predominant. The usual signs and symptoms of the chronic gastritis include heaviness, belching, vomiting, flatulence, bloating, and pain, which should be, which should be differentiated from other gastrointestinal pathology with the similar symptomatics. Boy, I'm sorry. Physical examination of the patient of the, uh, with the chronic gastritis in complicated helicobacter pylori associated atrophy gastritis. Clinical findings are few and non specific. Epigastric tenderness may exist. If gastric ulcers coexist, coag positive stool may result from occult blood loss. Bad breath or smelly breath and abdominal pain or discomfort may occur with the bloating associated with bacterial overgrowth syndrome. Physical findings may result from the development of the pernicious anemia and neurological complications in patients with autoimmune atrophic gastritis. With severe co cobalamin deficiencies, the patient is pale and slightly etheric skin and eyes. The pulse is rapid and the heart may be enlarged. Auscultation usually reveals the systolic flow new murmur. As we don't have ability due to this pandemic to show your real patients, well, at least on the current moment, I'm proposing you to see uh, actually very good presentation video how to physically examine the patient with gastrointestinal pathology. During this video, it's clearly explained and showed how it should be done. So let's start. It's a very short video, but very informative. Don't forget to wash hands. And right now, don't forget to wear a mask.
So I would like to add that the palpation should be started uh, from non-painful areas if your patient having pain, because if you will start your palpation with the area when where the patient feels pain, uh, he will, patient will not allow you to normally palpate other uh, parts of his abdomen due to dependence mechanisms. 
and if uh, you wanted to observe abdominal aorta, uh, you should remember that in uh, obese patient it's uh, or hypersthenic patient sometimes it's absolutely impossible. So only auscultation we have for observation of abdominal aorta or imagining studies. Laboratory studies in a patient with chronic gastritis includes includes sorry, a rapid urease test should be done on a gastric biopsy tissue, Helicobacter pylori bacterial culture or gastric biopsy tissue is usually performed in a research setting or to assess antibiotic suspectability in patients from first line or indication term phase. So the most frequently used and not very expensive, or, but not, it's not cheap, a radiative urease test, don't forget about it. Also, we have option for uh, a stool antigen test for Helicobacter pylori evaluation. A tropic gastritis may be assessed by measuring the ratio of pepsinogen 1 to pepsinogen 2 in the serum. Uh, these both agents are synthesized and secreted by gastric cell, chief cells. After being secreted into the gastric lumen, they are converted in, into proteolytic active pepsins, and the level of epitinogen 1 in the serum decreases as gastric chief cells are lost during the gastric artrophy, uh, resulting in decreasing of this 1 to second ratio. Gastric carcinoma cures, especially the intestinal type, usually in association with the severe atrophic gastritis. Measuring the levels of pepsinogen uh, 1 and 2 and the ratio between them in the serum is useful in screening for atrophic gastritis and gastric cancer in regions with the high incidence of these disorders. Uh, the following test results suggested the diagnosis of autoimmune gastritis. Antiparietal and anti factor antibodies in the serum present, achlorhydria, both nasal, basal, basal, sorry, and stimulated, and hypergastrinemia. Low serum cobalamin levels are below 100 uh, picogram by milliliter. Possible abnormal results of Schilling test should be corrected by intrinsic factor. Endoscopy, as imagined in studies, is helpful for analyzing the subepithelial microvascular architecture, as well as the mucosal surface microstructure without tissue biopsy. Upper gastrointestinal endoscopy is essential for establishing the diagnosis of gastritis. Also, some studies have suggested that Helicobacter pylori infection can be determined on the basis of unique endoscopic features, particularly the presence of atraumagularity, uh, whether there is a specific relation between Helicobacter pylori and macroscopic features remain controversial. Multiple biopsy specimens should be obtained, tissue sampling from the gastric and antrum in Cicera, and corpus is essential to establish the topography of the gastritis and to identify atrophy or end intestinal metaplasia, which is usually patchy. It's recommended that biopsy samples of the gastric body and those from the antrum and in cicera, uh, be submitted in separate containers for pathological evaluation. Endoscopic findings of the granulomatous gastritis include mucosal nodularity with cobblestoning, multiple aptus ulcers, linear or serpiginous ulceration, sect atropos, antral nerving, hypoperistalsis, and duodenal strictures. Extensive gastric involvement may resemble alinitis plastica. Endoscopic Findings in lymphocytic gastritis include large folds and aptoid erosions with the appearance of small, heaped up volcano like mounds poked with the central crater. The endoscopic pattern has also been described as vari varioliform gastritis. I'm sorry. The endoscopic findings of red, flux, and chemical gastropathy are those of the gastric mucosa that is red and has red streaks with the areas of apparent hemorrhage. 
Uh, on this slide, you can see differences in endoscopic picture of the normal stomach. You, we can see clearly gastric folds on macro or histological findings. And in case of superficial gastritis, present signs of inflammation and flattening of the normal folds. In case of atrophic gastritis, this is completely practically loss of uh, gastric folds and cells, which is changed to inflammatory process and flattening of the folds and small hemorrhages it's seen on the macro endoscopic picture and intestinal metaplasia where a uh, usual uh, healthy mucosa of the stomach is changed to intestinal or other type of the cells and present like a cobblestones and uh, mucosa like a chronic gastritis treatment uh, can be aimed at a specific etiological agent, if such an agent is known in a patient case, each patient. Some entities manifested by chronic gastritis do not have well-established treatment protocols. For example, in lymphocytic gastritis, some cases of spontaneous healing have been reported. However, because of the disease has a chronic course, treatment is recommended. At first, we should start from the diet and tell patient uh, to keep uh, and maintain total calories 1,600 of the day and more, and this amount of the food should be divided into at least five portions during the day. Patients should avoid food that lead to increasing of secretion of a gastric contain of the stomach juice included or for, for example yes is different citrus fruits tomatoes milk alcohol smoking coffee spicy foods and patients should prefer known as healthy food it means uh, multiple veggies with probiotic food fish instead of their actually fatty meat uh, and high, high fiber foods for relief in symptoms and improvement of the digestion. Pharmacotherapy for Helicobacter pylori, first specific recommendation for Helicobacter pylori medication, are usually limited to peptic ulcer disease, but now if you established already the etiology of Helicobacter pylori for your patient with Chronic gastritis, pharmacotherapy should be prescribed. Antibiotics that have proven effectiveness against Helicobacter pylori include clarithromycin, amoxicillin, metronidazole, tetracycline, and purazolidone. One is a version of the traditional bismuth metronidazole tetracycline triple therapy in which three different combinations using clarithromycin have been approved, including two dial therapies consisting of 500 mg of clarithromycin three times daily plus either omeprazole or anesthetic bismuth citrate. The cure rates reported in the packaging literature suggest that the three combinations are similarly effective. Clinical experience has, experience has shown that the most effective of these regimens is BMT triple therapy followed by ranitidine bismuth citrate plus clarithromycin and then by omeprazole plus clarithromycin. Evaluator, uh, this uh, therapy is presented with the dosage, dosages presented uh, actually on the slide, and I suggest you to, to memorize them and because the similar therapy will be used for treatment. Uh, peptic ulcer disease with the etiology of, of Helicobacter pylori, and uh, the similar will be uh, used for treatment Helicobacter pylori as a cause of dyspepsia. Evaluate the radication at least four weeks after the beginning of the treatment. The radication may be assessed by means of non-invasive methods such as urine breast test or stool antigen test, which is uh, cheaper and more specific compared with urea breast test, more sensitive. 
biopsy. Follow-up may be individualized dependent on the finding during endoscopy and severity of disorder. Atrophic gastritis treatment. One diagnosis is established, treatment can be directed to elimination of cause of engines, which is possibly in cases uh, of the Helicobacter pylori associated atrophic gastritis. To correct complication of the disease, especially in patients with autoimmune atrophic gastritis who develop pernicious anemia uh, with the replacement of B12 deficiency, to attempt uh, to reverse the atrophic process. If Helicobacter pylori is identified as an underlying cause of gastritis, subsequent eradication now is almost generally an accepted practice. Currently, the most widely used and efficient therapies for, to eradicate Helicobacter pylori are triple therapy or quadruple therapy presented on previous slide. Quadruple therapy recommended as second line treatment. Uh, comparing with the triple therapy, which is the first line treatment. In both cases, the best results are achieved by administering therapy for 10 to 14 days. Also, some studies have recommended the duration of seven days, and I would suggest that for, uh, for non-severe cases or depending on severity of the disorders and macro and histological findings, choose your regime. Uh, and to refer this regime to the guidelines for treatment of uh, atrophic gastritis associated with Helicobacter pylori infection in your precise country. The accepted definition of the cure is no evidence of Helicobacter pylori four or more weeks after the end of antimicrobial therapy. And that is all that I would like to tell you about uh, chronic gastritis. Uh, so, if you have some questions, please put them under the presentation in our YouTube channel and I will respond to you uh, soon and have a nice day. Thank you for being present and to have a good time. Bye-bye.